Um, first thing we're going to do is going to quickly look um, through what we're going to talk about to give you an overview so you're not kind of thinking, okay, what's going on here? What are they talking about? So let's quickly go over that first. Do you think you could put the screen up there? Cool, thanks. Right, so we're going to cover a couple of points. First points we're going to cover is the Let It Roll opening ceremony. We'll come back to that in a sec. We're going to look at some preparation and sound design we did. We're going to look at some orchestra and writing for a scene, how emotions can affect um, the certain feel of a, of, a, of a score or a piece um, in a score. Um, and then we're going to look at some more gritty, straight-up drum and bass stuff. So we're going to look at bass sound design, drum processing, how we build and approach the track, um, how we lay out a project and how we mix down. So there's a lot to get through. Um, so let's crack on. Right, so let's quickly talk about the Let It Roll opening ceremony. I'll quickly explain a little bit about that first. Um, so a couple of months ago, the guys from Let It Roll... You can see that, okay. A couple of months ago, the guys from Let It Roll approached us and asked us if we were interested about doing this year's opening ceremony. Um, obviously, we jumped at the chance. Um, we had an initial phone call with them, and they said, okay, it's going to be 20 minutes long. We were like, oh, whoa, okay, 20 minutes long. And um, there's going to be about four drum and bass tunes in there, and it's going to be about a story about a kind of robot. And that's all the information they gave us. So we were like, okay, what are we going to do? So we better, we better start making like robot sound design and some preparation work. Um, so just give you a quick um, layout of how it goes. I'm not sure how well you can see that. Um, but this is the minutes at the top. So we've got one to 17 minutes. There's four drum and bass tracks, which are kind of the darkish blue sections. And then in between the tracks, there's a scene. Um, and it was written from a script. So the script, we received the script, and there was text in the script, there was characters in the script. Um, in this particular score, there's one character who's a robot, and he comes, uh, approaches from Earth. I'm not going to give too much away because you all have to see it tomorrow. Um, so going back to the start of the process, when we had the first call with them, we didn't have a script, so we had nothing. And they said, okay, it's going to be about a robot. You need to do four drum and bass tracks. So the first thing we, the first thing we thought about is, okay, we need to do some kind of robot sound design. Um, and one of the clues they gave us was that footsteps, the robot footsteps, were going to be a main feature in the whole score. Um, so that's basically where we started, making some robot footsteps. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly look at the, the whole score in, uh, in Logic. So we use Logic 9 for this particular project. And this is the... Hold on, let me get myself a bit organised here. And this is the, actually the whole score. Um, I'm just going to quickly briefly run over what, what you can see here and then we'll look at some, some detail work. So yeah, this is um, a 17 minute score from start to finish. Um, at the top here in the red, it's not very clear is it, but in the top here in the red is the actual kind of drum and bass songs. So within this project we kind of put the whole score together and there's lots of other different projects where we've like made tunes and uh, made a particular sound design which we'll show you later and then we kind of we put it all together in this project for the final score. So as I said earlier, one of the main things we had to start with was the, was the footsteps. And we had to make a whole load of sound design for the footsteps, and which was actually really fun. Um, it was a really good coincidence actually because I just was refurbishing my house at the time. So I had loads of like power tools around and like this metal kind of like this scaffolding and stuff. So we just basically spent a day just hitting poles and like having drills going about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly play you the intro of the of the actual whole score. Um, so the kind of score is the robot comes from Earth, uh, or no, the robot comes to Earth. He lands on the festival and he's kind of looking around and walking around the stage. So let's play this clip and then we'll look at how we built that quickly.
I smell human flesh. So that's basically the intro, and so the robot comes to Earth, as you heard, and the footsteps kind of take place, uh, or kind of take over a little bit, and there's a main feature. So I'm going to quickly show you how we build the footsteps. So as I said, we started, spent just basically one day hitting metal things, and the kind of first element we, or the best, best element we found for the main footstep was uh, just us hitting our air conditioning unit, which pretty much sounds like this. So it's lots of kind of random hits. And then what we did is we just built kind of all little bits of sound design we made around that. So let me just make this a little bigger. So here you've kind of got kind of all different kinds of Foley bits and machines. Also some electronic stuff in there. Here you've got the metal kind of sounding elements where we've been hitting kind of metal and stuff to give that. And we've also got some like, little electrical sparks and stuff like that, which we put in. So, put it all together, and you have a big angry robot walking around. So yeah, that was really fun to do, and something a lot different. Um, in between the footsteps, you probably also notice there's music under it, uh, and that's something which we, uh, which we also wrote here. Um, and, it, and what we did is, obviously there's one character and there's, there's, one ro there's the robot, so we, what we had to do is try and also write little pieces of music in between that. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you a little bit about how we can emphasize the emotion in, uh, in a character or in a particular score. So let's quickly open that project. Do you want to quickly go through that? So uh, once we receive the full story of the, um, of the project, you start looking at, at it and reading it, and you get like this picture in your head and you start thinking about how you're going to translate that to music. Um, we haven't, uh, this is one of the first really big projects we did um, with a score. So it was very important to understand that, that there's a big difference between making like a, a drum and bass track or just a general pop song or um, and making music for a score. Oops. So let me get... So, um, because when you make a, a drum and bass track, it's usually built around one emotion and the script is like mood swings and emotion swings all the time, so it's, it's very different. Um, so I'm going to show you a little example of, um, where, uh, of the story and how we 
uh, make the music around it. Um, there's a bit in the middle of the story, and here's a bit of the script. Um, we've been inhabiting your planet for centuries, hiding in the clouds and sleeping near the Earth's core, aware of being sinister creatures for human mankind, often also symbolized as gods or giants in your mythology. But there's no reason to fear us. So, how we, uh, how we made it is, we just look at um, a piece of script like this, and then we're going to think about what the emotions are and, and what's actually happening. So, what we've done is we kind of wrote down the expressions next to every sentence, sometimes even just single words. Uh, the first two sentences are like a bit mysterious, you don't know exactly what's going on yet. And then uh, there's kind of a sad, melancholic uh, vibe to the... Uh, you get sort of an insight of how the robot is actually feeling. Um, then there's a slight tension and at the, at the end it's again mysterious explaining. So how do you how do you em emphasize these emotions? Um, so I don't know if any of you play an instrument or can you raise your hand if you do? Yeah. It's, I guess there's, it's mostly producers here. Um, so it's, it's good to uh, explain a little bit about um, chords and notes and stuff. Um, I'm going to keep it quite simple. Um, think of one note. You think you can play one note and you don't really have this feeling, emotion to it, because it's just one note. Then you start adding another note, you play two notes at the same time, and you start getting a chord. Um, basic chords like A, B, C, it's basic stuff. Then when you add more notes, um, it's getting more complicated. The emotions get more complicated. Um, you can play it in series and things will change as well. Uh, the most basic chord is uh, it's a major chord and it's generally um, perceived as like a happy uh, chord and then you can also play a minor chord which kind of makes it a sad feeling so you can keep things really simple and just divide it into happy or sad um, and start out with just playing a sad chord or a happy chord Um, so some other examples, for example, when, when, it, when it gets more complicated, um, you can think of jazz. Like, if you think of jazz, you think like it's mellow, it's relaxed, it's smooth. Um, think of um, those are all seventh chords, like extended, um, more complicated chords, and you can use those to make emotions more complex. Um, you've probably heard of Slayer. Uh, the metal band, it's like the complete opposite, and you get more like a dark feeling. Anyway, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how uh, these emotions can change um, if you use different chords. So here's the, um, um, I've got three different takes. The first one is, it's just a vocal and um, a piano placeholder so you can hear what's happening. So the first thing I'm going to um, show you is the, the final take we, we took. We have been inhabiting your planet for centuries. Hiding in the clouds and sleeping near the Earth's core. Aware of being sent 
So um, you can see we've, you can hear we've um, tried to make it work with the vocal. Um, the chords are really simple, so it's 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 a great example of how things can change. Uh, it's just a two-note chord, so um, you can see with those two notes and these chords in a row, it really you really get um, a good enhancement of the emotion. Um, it's also really easy to fuck it up. <laughs> um, so I, I can show you how the same uh, scene will sound, but in the second part of this uh, of the scene, it will all the chords will change into major chords, which are going to be the happy chords, and you'll hear what's going to happen. have been inhabiting your planet for centuries, hiding in the clouds and sleeping near the Earth's core, aware of being sinister creatures for human mankind, but often also symbolized as gods or giants in your mythology. No reason to fear us. You can hear it's it it at some points it kind of fits. It, you get still get this kind of mysterious feel, but it's way too happy. It just doesn't doesn't work with the flow. Um, so it's it's um, it's really uh, important to get to get this right. <laughs> I've got an, another example of um, how you can actually play those same minor and major chords but put them in a different order and that it will show you that it's not like oh I need some I need a happy five let's le let's just use a, a major chord um, so what what you'll hear now is the second part will be the same chords as the final take, but with different root notes. We have been inhabiting your planet for centuries, hiding in the clouds and sleeping near the Earth's core, aware of being sinister creatures for human mankind, but often also symbolized as gods or giants in your mythology. But there is no reason to fear us. So, even though it's, it's really similar to the final take we, uh, we've chosen, it's, you get, still get a completely dark vibe uh, from it which is not what we were after. Um, so, you see, when, when you start with a note, it's simple, then it gets a chord, it gets more complex. Then when you put it in series, it gets, even gets more complex, complex. And then when you put it in a bigger picture, in, in the full score, things can change as well. So that's, um, that's really, it's, it's, it's really a, a complex task to get everything to work together. Um, one thing I want to say about this is we, I've showed you an example with a, a, a piano and it's, it's, it says piano placeholder. Uh, one of the, this is one of the parts where you, you get close to um, the robot itself and you kind of feel what the robot feels. So we wanted to emphasize it um, with a different, different timbre as well, with a different instrument. 
So I can play you the final take, and we've replaced the, the piano with a guitar, um, because the guitar sounds just a little bit more soft and rounded. So as Bart said, what we normally do is, when we, when we kind of write for, a, write for a scene, what we'll do is we'll just sketch out in a piano quickly, and then what we'll do is we'll think like, okay, what, where, what instrument can we use here? Or should we just use the piano? Is the piano sound cool? So as Bart said, in this instance, we use guitar and then obviously some strings and some orchestra elements. So we're just going to play the, the final clip. Okay, so that was the that was the final section that we did, and obviously the the guitar and the extra elements gives it a much more epic kind of feel than just the piano, obviously. So yeah, that was that part. A little bit about how we approach um, how we approach orchestra and writing for a scene. Um, now what I want to talk about a little bit is um, the kind of general concept a bit, and then we'll look at some like gritty drum and bass. Um, so within the score, um, there was a finale track, which was kind of should be the biggest, the loudest, the most epic track you can ever imagine, because <laughs> um, it's the actual final part of the score. And what we wanted to do is, um, basically, in the in the actual score, in the script itself, it, it kind of said that the um, that the basically the robot needs energy from people. Um, receives this energy from, uh, from sound, basically. Um, and then what happens is the spaceship takes off. Um, and then th that needs to be incorporated into the track. So we were like, right, how do we, how do we incorporate a spaceship taking off into a drum and bass track? And it, it, it was a little bit obvious for us. And we, we were like, okay, let's just make a bass. Um, let's just make a bass from which kind of sounds like a spaceship taking off. Um, so what we wanted to kind of do is we were thinking like, okay, how can we, how can we, you know, what, what can we do here? So the kind of first idea and the first process was, okay, let's just jam out all day and make bass sounds basically and see if, if, see if one, one kind of clicks. So I think the best thing for me to do is play you the final kind of section of the, of the score, uh, which is the final uh, drum and bass track. And what we wanted to do here is we kind of wanted to take it from orchestra and then it kind of blend into drum and bass gradually, building all the time, building all the time. Uh, and then the kind of bass comes in with a spaceship kind of taking off and we thought, okay, perfect. We're just going to do kind of a pitch up bass, which kind of gives it that taking off feel. And then it can go completely mad into a drum and bass track. So we're going to play you the last bit. And this kind of goes from kind of classic orchestra into drum and bass. It's the, the finale track. Thank you, friends. It's time to count down the final sequence.
Right, so that's basically the kind of bass that comes in. And what we're going to do is we're going to take you back to the first step. So you've obviously heard the song. You've heard what bass we chose. But um, where we started out was in the script was this kind of spaceship rising. So we were, we, what we did is we spent a day kind of making loads of bass sounds. Um, just a quick, uh, quick briefing on how we work. Basically, we work in audio most of the time. And what we like to do is we like to, on days off, on days we're bored, days we're not uh, creative, whatever, we'll just spend the whole day making sounds, random sounds. Or if we're working on a specific project, then we'll be working on specific sounds to, to, to work in that particular project. Um, so what we do is we find that the best way to work, to, to make all the sounds before, and then when you're actually writing the tune, you're writing fast, you're just throwing samples in there, see which works, rather than spending like two hours engineering a bass in the project and getting completely lost, getting fed up, it doesn't work, and then you quit, basically, which just can happen. So let's quickly look at this project. There's a lot of really bad stuff in here, um, but I'll quickly run you through the, um, the main kind of bass sound. So... The first one is this one. Can you guys kind of see that a bit, a bit okay? So, so the first kind of, um, these four red ones are all just layers of bases, basically. And in this, all these instances, these red ones, we use FM8, which is pretty much our, our go-to synth. Um, so let me quickly put this one at the top. This was where it started out. This kind of thing. Um, let me quickly show you what we did here it's it's pretty it's pretty a simple simple patch to be honest um and a lot of work is coming from the distortion if i just turn off the distortion here sounds pretty rubbish um so i'll quickly run through the fm8 patch um it's a pretty simple patch but the main feature is um who uses fm8 here actually is there no yeah one person oh my god Guys, use more FM8. So, um, if you don't know about frequency modulation, which is FM, then go and Google it, because there's loads to tell, and half of the stuff is so scientifically complicated that you probably won't understand it anyway, unless you're a complete boffin. Um, but I'll quickly explain what I did uh, without trying to go into too much detail, because we'll be here all day. So... Um, what we've got within this patch, there's, I'm just going to turn off these operators here and then you can quickly get an idea. So basically the main feature of this particular bass was um, basically the harmonic in the bass. So there's actually, um, in this particular instance, the fundamental frequency is an F, so that's the root note. Um, and then um, within FM8, what we've done is we've put a two and a half ratio what that is, it's two and a half times your fundamental frequency. So if we used F two and a half times in frequency terms, actually is an A. Um, so you kind of have to think about it, uh, think about FMA a slightly different way. So in this instance, we've kind of made a chord, so to speak, within, within FMA. Um, let me quickly play you that. So the two and a half ratio is just a sine wave, which is this. And probably the first thing you can hear is a kind of a bit of modulation. So what we did on this particular bass is we just used a LFO on the, on the pitch. 
to give it that kind of energetic kind of feel, you know? So if you just take that off, it's quite static, quite boring. And then you add just that tiny bit of movement. It really gives it some energy. So this is kind of the main two and a half ratio um, operator which we're using. And then to back that up, we've used, or actually it's the other way around. This is the, <laughs> this is the main one. And then we've backed it up with a two and a half ratio. But the initial... Um, the initial idea is, was to use the kind of harmonic. So we've got the F, which is just the sub, pretty much, or which is just the low end, and that's on ratio one, which is just whatever root note you're playing in the sequencer, which in this particular instance is an F. So if we add that two and a half ratio to it, we're starting to get a bit more harmonics in there. Um, this one has a parabolic wave form, which is pretty similar to a sine wave. And then what we've done is we add some more bits and pieces to the top of it. So this is just a chain of operator, operators with a carry up. Um, and pretty simple, really. Just use the P PWM ramp mod waveform, which is a ratio four. And that's being fed in to carrier D. And then that is being fed in to operator X, which is like a noise generator and a small saturator. So, yeah, that's giving a little bit top end. So if we just take that off, it's just giving a little bit of character in the top end. That's basically the initial patch, which sounds really rubbish. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go and add some plugins onto it. Um, this instance is quite simple. Um, I'll show you some instances in a sec where there's like 20 plugins and all kinds of distortion on it. But this one was fairly simple. The, the processing comes in, the, in just the layering. So we used, uh, on this particular instance, we used guitar rig, and then you're going to hear a huge change in sound. So a whole load of distortion, uh, which is giving it like the kind of almost guitar, metal guitar kind of feel. Um, and in this instance, you can see I've loaded a couple of guitar amps here. Um, that was just to test out you know, just while you're writing the bass, just to see which one works best. One that was chosen was the Van 51 classic guitar amp. I haven't used the cabinet. The cabinet is kind of uh, is kind of trying to replicate the the miking of the actual cabinet in a studio. So there's probably some some kind of reverb and bits and pieces that you probably wouldn't want on your main bass. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty simple patch really. Just the just the distortion, and then I think there's just a bit of EQing here. Oh, I just took the low end out here, which is pretty simple. So that's kind of the, where it started with that particular sound, and then we start thinking, okay, this doesn't sound good enough. Um, definitely the sub wasn't stable enough in the sound, so we're obviously we thought, okay, let's just layer a sub under it, which we did, which is just a really simple sine wave with, with some distortion on it. Just quickly look at the FMA patch. Really simple. Just two sine waves in a fundamental F in this particular instance, ratio one. If you look at the frequency analyzer, all it's doing is giving, all it's doing is giving your, your sub and your first harmonic, which is that one there. We've added a little bit of distortion on it just to en enhance the harmonic. And this is a perfect example of what distortion does to your sound. So I've just turned the distortion off now, and you can see you've just got a sub here. And I'll put the distortion on, and you can see how much harmonics and actual distortion adds to the sound. So I've put the distortion on there, you can see it's added like a, a, th a, th a first harmonic to it, which is a really interesting way to make your sound full and to make them big. So yeah, we layered the mid with the sub. And then, what we wanted to do is we wanted to try and enhance the chord uh, of the actual sound. Um, we knew that it was coming from an orchestral section, so we thought it would be nice if we can kind of have a bit of an uplifting chord here. Um, so what we did is we layered a couple of instances, which are these two, which is just top end, basically. And I think one is an F and one is a C, I think. Actually, it's kind of... Kind of uplifting feel to it 
and then play them all together. You've got the main sound. So that was kind of the main sound we went for. So what we would have done is we would have bounced all kind of different ideas and different audio files. So what we're left with is just a big folder with all kind of different modulated, um, modulated versions and different distorted versions and reverb versions of this sound. So when we're actually ready to write the project, uh, we can just throw all the sounds in and see which works best, etc. Um, I'm going to quickly show you some of the the ones that didn't cut the grade uh, in the particular project. This was the project we worked on, actually. Um, and we made a couple of other bass sounds, which are pretty rubbish, I think. Ooh, hold on, so I'm going to play you these. These were the other contenders for the, for the main bass sound. Um, we've got this one. Which is okay in a certain way, but <laughs> not great. Um, this particular one is pretty similar. Again, used FM8 with. Um, I haven't looked at this patch actually. <laughs> so we used FM8. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty simple setup. Again, the sound is coming from the distortion, pretty much. If we take this off, probably don't hear much. That's the original sound without a distortion, so you can see it's pretty, pretty dull, pretty boring, but it's still got some harmonic content in there. And what we try and do is we try and enhance that harmonic content with, with some distortion. I just showed you earlier the sub and it added an extra harmonic when you add it on. So a distortion, that's what it's doing. It's just adding lots of, lots of odd and even uh, frequencies to your sound. Um, on this one, on this bass, we used uh, Amplitude. I think when we first started, this is the first ever like guitar kind of distortion we started using and still use it sometimes nowadays. It's kind of, kind of really just blows things up, to be honest, a, a lot. And it adds some like strange, ugly artifacts in there, but sometimes that sounds cool, you know. So, so you use it quite a lot. It's pretty simple, pretty simple. Again, I haven't used the cabinet, just the top end. And quite a lot of gaining going on. So yeah, that was another bass sound, which was a contender for the main sound, which didn't make it. Let's have a little listen to the next one. Um, so as I said earlier, it was a spaceship taking off in the scene. So we wanted to try and make a bass kind of spaceship sound. And this one was made in massive. We try to just make an engine, basically, which sounds like this. Kind of sounds more like a Ferrari or something. Um, pretty strange patch, actually, this one. Um, it's kind of all detuned and doesn't have any reference to kind of any... Um, yeah, it's, it, it kind of works in a certain way, but it's, it's, it's kind of... It shouldn't work if you look at the patch, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of run by this, run by this uh, oscillator three here. And then what we've done is we've just added a pitch to it. Or we just added a pitch to it, which kind of just evolves over time. Uh, what else have we done here? The filters are turned off, I think. Yeah, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple patch, really. There's no end processing on it. So yeah, that's kind of the engine taking off. That was more of a kind of fun, fun kind of thing where I was, where we were like, okay, let's just try and make a car, basically a car from a synth. Um, just and see if we can turn it into a spaceship somehow. Um, and the last ones were complete failures. Um, we wanted to just show these, we wanted to put these in here just to show that obviously half of the time, half of the stuff we does actually doesn't work out. Um, so these are, kind of the, these are kind of some of the bases that didn't cut the grade. It's kind of pretty boring, to be honest. Pretty standard. Again, this is FM8. I'm not going to go too much detail into this. A um, whole ton of plugins. Camel fat. Omnicide. Dyn dynamic spectrum mapper. 
which is kind of uh, which is like a multi-band compressor. You've got I don't know why that's on there, but you've got an assemble on there, which is giving a bit of width, um, more distortion from Satch from Saturn, for Phil Saturn, which is awesome. More distortion from Trash. A um, bit of EQing. Um, we've obviously layered this with a sub, so we took the low end out. There was probably artifacts in the high end, which weren't very nice. And even more distortion to kind of finish it off. So you've got, like, on this particular instance, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six of distortion, five series of, dis of, of distortion, basically, on the patch, which all kind of adding, gently adding harmonics throughout the process. Um, I'll quickly play this without the without the plugins. It just sounds ridiculous, I think. It's pretty boring playing FM8 patch. And the distortion kind of gives it all the character. And the grit. But that one we didn't really like, so we kind of dumped that one. Um, and the last one, which is a, a massive failure. So when we're, when we're writing and we're sitting down to write, obviously, Everything we touch doesn't turn to gold. I wish it did. Um, but there's a lot of instances where it's just a lot of failure and a lot of trying and a lot of um, sitting there thinking, OK, you know, this didn't work out, but I need to go again. I need to keep going. I need to keep going. Because you can get very disheartened sometimes if you're trying to write music all day and especially trying to write basses and drums and stuff. And it's not working out. You know, sometimes it can happen. Um, but this is a great example. I think this is the one we started off This is the actual bass sound we started off with and it was kind of like, oh my god, is it going to work today? Is it going to be a lucky day? Maybe it's just going to be one of those days where nothing works out. But we carried on and then we finally got something we liked. So yeah, this was the kind of the big failure. Which sounds like some elephant dying somewhere or something. <laughs> So yeah, you can also see it's not just a, a matter of making a patch and then just throw it in your project and it works. It's really like a, um, an accumulation of, of, of things, not one uh, patch, not just one plugin. It's just it's it's all these little layers that make it uh, the end product. And for some, sometimes you you make something like a patch and it doesn't really it's okay but you just leave it apart for uh, another project and then later you go back in and add these little uh, extra things and then it start to get alive and in this case with the with the bass like you said um, you start off with a with a patch that sounds pretty interesting but it's not there yet and then with layering all these sounds it, it you, you can really get it into where you want to have it in the project cool so that ba basically the bass so what we're trying to what we're trying to emphasize here is preparation basically so we would spend a day making all the bass sounds and then next thing obviously is drums so we would obviously spend a day making all tied with different drums and just having fun as well because this was really cool to do and um, so we're going to show you an example here of a typical drum track we would make from scratch um, I think most of our drums, about 90% of our drums, are come, through, come from Superior Drummer, which is like a, a drum emulation kind of, kind of plug-in, which is really awesome. Um, can you guys see that? Yeah. Has anyone used Superior Drummer? Yeah, a bit. OK, so basically, you've got a whole load of drum kits. You've got a whole load of uh, snares you can choose from, for instance. You can change a snare up here, you've got toms, you can change crash up, etc. There's loads of different packs, there's loads of different um, loads of different sounds, which is awesome. But the main cool thing about Superior Drummer is um, the, the actual mixer and the mics. So basically, when, you, when you're recording a live drum kit in a studio, you've got a lot, a lot of the time you have lots of different mics, you'll have overheads, you maybe have a, a, a mic on the other side of the room, like an ambience mic, which you can mix into it later. You obviously have a mic for your kick, etc. And in this in this plugin, you can you can manipulate all that. Um, so you've got access to all the mics, and you can manipulate all the mics to w exactly what you want. So it's 
it's really, really flexible, which we love. 